to start with a round of applause before I've done any work is truly amazing, I have to say. Imagine you lived in a world where everything started with a round of applause. Think about the energy and the focus you would bring every project. The rest of this could be absolute rubbish. You have no idea, right? <laughs> My name is Jay Maldonado, I'm 35 years old, I'm a Mexican-American and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. My husband and I have been together for 10 years, so usually that gets the round of applause. <laughs> no, forget it, I don't want it now, your pity applause. I actually grew up in Indiana, so that's pretty exciting. A little space, a little scary space called Gary, Indiana. Gary is usually known for one of three things, at least I found when I mentioned this. And up until recently, two out of three of them used to be really amazing. One, in The Music Man, apparently there's a song where it's mentioned. Two, it's where Michael Jackson was born. Can't really kid about that anymore. Yeah. And then finally, it was the murder capital of the world for many years. So not a great place to raise kids. My parents, um, they had me when they were like really young, like, hey, we just hit puberty, now we're pregnant young. <laughs> yeah. My dad went to prison for killing a man. That was tough. And my mom, um, well, she kind of spiraled after that. She started doing drugs, and then she started selling drugs, which is really difficult to do. Like, you usually choose one or the other. You're not the buyer and the seller in this scenario. So I like to think my mom is pretty cool. It also put a lot of pressure on me as a child. I was the oldest, and so I had to raise all my siblings. I remember going to elementary school and leaving during lunch. I didn't have lunch anyway. And going home and getting my sister and getting her ready for preschool. And then going back to preschool for the second half of the day so that way we could leave school together. One day, this man in a trench coat came up to me, and he said, hey, are you Jason and Jenny? And I was like, oh, because McGruff, this dog <laughs> that they teach you in elementary school, says, like, don't take candy from strangers, right? He's like a detective dog, and don't go with strangers. And so he was like, hey, Jason and Jenny, get into my car. And I was like, what? I don't think so. But as it... McGruff doesn't teach you jujitsu or karate or give you a taser. <laughs> and so this man grabbed me and my sister and he put us in her car and we drove away, kidnapped. My sister just cried and cried until she eventually just cried herself to sleep. I was big brother, so I had to maintain some composure. And so I just kept checking out the windows. And eventually, before I fell asleep, or right before I fell asleep, we pulled into this ranch-style home. And the man got out, and I heard him utter the words, foster care, which means nothing to a child, because you just still think you're being abducted. Now, there's a couple of things before we move forward that are important to know. I'm really big in emotions and understanding them and unpacking them and I push them onto people and unfortunately I'm pushing them onto you today. These are my cats, my children, and because me and my husband like to push personas onto everything, our cats have motivational posters all over our house <laughs> at ankle level <laughs> because we believe that they need emotional support. This one that sits above their bowl says, too small to fail. <laughs> if you visit, you will see these. <laughs> I say this because I live in a world right now where social media is everywhere. Emotions mean everything to me. And when I was abducted and brought to foster care, if I had social media at that time, I probably would have uploaded this, or scared. But it doesn't quite capture everything, does it? It's cute, but somehow it felt a little bit more raw than this. Did you know that there's like um, 2,800 different emojis, all designed to help you perfectly find that little micro emotion that you have in you? 
And people use them all day, every day, right? I'm feeling happy. I just want a free Starbucks or something. If it existed back then, I might have like, marked myself safe from my own life on Facebook. Now, in foster care, um, they do this thing. I'm not sure if they still do it today, but they do this thing in foster care where um, they'll gather all the kids in the community who are also in foster care. And on Thursdays, we would have visitation rights with our parents every other week. One week off, no visitations from either parent. The next week, yes, visiting a parent. And because our parents were split, because my dad was in prison, that meant we only got one visitation a month. And they would take us to this church on Sundays. And all the kids would be sitting in the rows in front of Jesus, and the parents would come filing in, the sinners. And one by one, the kids would just leap out of their chairs when they saw their parents. My mom, my dad, they would just run like, like, those, um, like those, those, uh, those uh, army people who were being reunited with their families, but much more severe because you're dealing with children who've just been kidnapped. And they would get up and run. And, and so I would sit there with my sister when we'd watch him get up and run, and her get up and run, and him get up and run, and her get up and run. And, and it was the first time that I dealt with a dodgeball moment, that fear of being picked last. But in this case, we weren't picked. Because my mom didn't show up, ever. So only a handful of things in life that really, really upset me, and one of them is seeing my sister just cry. And like I said, I tried to maintain composure because that's what a big brother is supposed to do, I was told. But you can't protect her from everything. She knew what was happening. And she would sit there and she would cry in front of families that were having the best times of their lives with their parents smiling and opening presents and having cake. If social media existed back then, I would have uploaded that. But again, it doesn't quite capture everything. It's at a young, such a young age, I realized the depth of emotion and what sadness means. And to this day, I still have yet to experience something that sad. It's something like 43% of Americans experience uh, emotional loneliness every year by themselves. We eventually got out of foster care. My dad served 10 years, got out in 10 years. He was originally given 20 for manslaughter. When I was younger, I was told that my dad went to prison. Um, really a heroic story, in fact. He went to prison because my mom was coming out of a bar while she was pregnant with my sister. Let's pause for a second. <laughs> Coming out of a bar, pregnant with my sister. And a man attacked my mom, forced himself on top of her, and tried to rape her while she was pregnant. And my dad found him, pulled him off, and beat him so bad that he died and went to prison. So when I was younger, my dad was like my hero, right? And when he got out of prison, I was like, who is this man? I'm so excited to be with him. And we went from trailer park homes to living in a place called Chesterton in Indiana, which is a great space to live. Because my dad worked so hard and he loved his kids. He was a great salesman. One day when I was 14, my dad came up to me and he said, hey, I need to talk to you about some stuff. And I said, OK. And I was 14, and I didn't know what gay meant, but I sure was Googling it best I could and running across everything you might find on Google. <laughs> and this was back, yes, before the internet was like a well-known thing, and kids were well-versed in everything about computers. And he sat me down, and he said, hey, listen, first, I want you to know that I love you. And I'm always here for you. Did you know that there is a history button <laughs> and I can see everything you and your sister search. And I was like, what? <laughs> your parents should not know your search terms. <laughs> and he said, do you want to talk about anything? 
And I didn't know what it meant to be gay. I certainly wasn't ready to say it out loud with confidence. And I just said, no thanks, peace out. <laughs> and I left. <laughs> I bring up this story because when my dad sat me down and said that to me, it was such a defining moment of feeling that loneliness go away and feeling close to somebody. In two moments, or two months from that very moment, when my dad was driving home from work, he was in a car accident and he died. I moved in with an aunt and uncle, loved my dad, praised my dad, put him on a pedestal. And I eventually went to Ball State University where I joined this amazing speech program and I made a lot of great friends. And I made something of myself there. I found a family there. At 21, I was talking to my mom, and my mom and dad never really got along uh, you know, after he went to prison. And as you do when somebody dies, you tell these great stories of them. And one day when I was telling a great story about how my dad rescued my mom from being sexually assaulted, my mom said, oh, that's not why your dad went to prison. He went to prison for killing a gay man. I politely asked her to elaborate. And she told me that him and a guy used to do this thing called fag rolling. Let's pause. Because it was enough times they did this that they had a name for it. Fag rolling, when they would find a third at a gay bar and convince them that they wanted to go home with him and that they would beat the shit out of him and rob him. What a cute emoji for shocked. And yet it doesn't still capture everything it's supposed to, does it? It's something like 16.2 million Americans out there go through um, depression cycles. And they don't talk about it with people. And they certainly don't spend time thinking about what it could mean, and how it plays on their emotions. I know I'm supposed to feel like some certain way about my dad. Conflicted in some way, I'm sure people would think, God, your dad's a monster. And it certainly is difficult for me because I have this man, at one point, who took someone away from my community served 10 years, knew I was gay, coming out of prison, because let's be honest, <laughs> but decided to raise a man for, his commu for my community. And I go back to those words that he used to say to me, like, I love you, and I'm always here for you. When I think about my dad, I'm, again, conflicted, so many emotions, because there's a part of me that really doesn't understand the person he was, but there's the part of me that truly understands the person he became. And it is a complex emotion of happiness and sadness at the same time that I'm still interpreting and trying to figure out for my own health. And there is no emoji for that. 